318, and we still have pew Bibles out there, I believe, for those of you who didn't bring your own Bible. So uh, you'll be okay if you don't have a Bible to refer to, but it might be a little bit of a help to be able to look in on the text as we go through the message this morning. So during the weeks when I have been preaching, I've been doing a series on spiritual war, spiritual war and the armor of God. And this is the third part, in one sense, the final part to this series, though there may be sort of an addendum coming down the road somewhere. So spiritual war and the army of God, and we're going on to our third part this morning. And we have been focusing on this text in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. And I've really encouraged you to make friends with this passage of Scripture, to get to know it, so that when you open your Bible, one of the places it likes to open to is Ephesians 6, because you've turned there so many times. And uh, to allow your mind to dwell and to focus on and meditate on what we're taught about spiritual warfare in this text, and then particularly the armor of God and each piece of it. So really, what Ephesians 6 does for us, it develops more clearly than anywhere else in Scripture, the metaphor of the Christian as a soldier of Christ. Metaphor meaning there's a direct comparison it's not like a simile, we are like soldiers of Christ, or we are as soldiers of Christ. It's a direct comparison. We are soldiers of Christ. Amen. And of course, Scripture uses other metaphors. Uh, it uses the metaphor of the Christian as a pilgrim. It uses the metaphor of the Christian as a builder. But the one that we're focusing on in Ephesians 6 is the Christian as a soldier. And if we have that before us, and Ralph came up with a great graphic of the soldier that's in your bulletin this morning that can help us to think in those terms. So the metaphor of the Christian as a soldier opens up rich veins of truth to us in terms of how we are to live the Christian life. Now the primary exhortations in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, our text, are two very simple ones. And the last time I preached, we focused on these. First one, be strong in the Lord. Amen. Not just be strong, generally. That's nice. It would be great if we all had the ability to just be strong. But understanding what we're up against, be strong in the Lord. And then the second exhortation, stand firm in the Lord. Perhaps the first one focusing on readiness for the battle, being strong and then to stand firm when we're in the midst of the battle and we find ourselves up against it, that we have to stand our ground and stand firm in the Lord. Now, in our text as well, the adversary that we're fighting against has been clearly identified and described. Ephesians 6, 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So we're not left in any kind of vague picture of who our adversary is. We're talking about the devil. We're talking about Satan. We're talking about uh, demonic principalities and powers under him whose mission is to destroy everything that has to do with Jesus and his people and basically to take us out if he could do that or at least to weaken us and take away the effectiveness of our lives. So the adversary has been clearly identified. It's against the devil's schemes that we stand. Verse 12 goes into even more detail. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So how are we going to be strong in the Lord and stand firm in the Lord against the devil and all the demonic forces under him? We are told, again in our text, very specifically, everything leads on very step by step. We can be strong, we can stand firm by putting on the full armor of God. The Greek word is panoply. It doesn't just mean armor, it means the full armor. 
It suggests the importance of having every piece of the armor on and not having parts of it that are omitted. So we are told specifically in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And then in my translation, New American Standard, in verse 13, it says, take up the full armor of God. I don't know if the NIV makes that distinction. Does it matter a lot? No, but I kind of like I kind of like the NASV because it tends to be very literal. And it says the first time in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. And then in verse 13, take up the full armor of God. Now, just as a matter of uh, kind of common sense and something worth pointing out, the armor will not do you and I any good if we do not stand courageously. It's not like these pieces of the armor are some magic thing. You put them on and, and now you're set. No, those earlier exhortations to be strong in the Lord, to stand in the Lord. We are responsible to take those to heart, to build them deeply into our lives. And then the armor of God becomes the means by which we can do that. So uh, we have to stand courageously if the armor is to do us any good. And then this one, which uh, again maybe goes without saying or is simply co common sense, the armor is useless if you don't put it on and take it up. Amen. I could have that whole panoply of God sitting right here on some kind of a, a storage shelf or something, and if I don't have it on, it's not going to do me any good. Or if I have a few pieces on and some of it's just left on the shelf, then I'm going to be exposed and weakened in those areas where I have failed Amen. to put on the armor and take up the armor. So as we think of what we need to do to stand strong in the Lord and to stand firm, uh, we are told we need to put on the full armor of God. Now, our goal in the message this morning is to equip ourselves, myself, and you as well, so we can fight and win in this warfare that we're in. We're not just equipping ourselves to fight with some kind of defeatist attitude or some kind of, well, who knows the way this thing is going to go. No, God has given us and provided through his son, Jesus Christ, everything we need for certain victory. So the goal is to equip ourselves, not simply to fight in the spiritual war, but to win, to be victors, as God says that we are, to be more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And if we're going to do that and use the armor of God, we need to first of all understand each piece of the armor of God. We need to understand it. You know, guess what? Being a Christian does not mean checking your brains at the church door. Okay, we have to be awake, alert, learners, thinkers, and we need to understand each piece of the armor of God. And that's part of my goal this morning is that we can think about each piece and what it means specifically. But then not only to understand it, but to know how to use it, to have that practical bent that says this armor is not for some kind of display or to be admired. Uh, visually, this armor has a very practical purpose that we need to use it. And so that's what the remainder of the message is going to be. And our message this morning is using the armor of God. So let's pray before we go forward here. Father, we've said all of these earlier things to uh, prepare our hearts and minds to have a context to see why it's so important that we uh, understand about the armor of God, that we read your word in Ephesians 6, that we meditate on it, that we think about it, and that we know what each piece of the armor means and what it's for. And then also, Lord, that we learn to be adept at using the armor of God. We become trained soldiers who uh, can step up and then in the heat of the battle, don't buckle under pressure, but are able to stand and use that armor of God to walk in the victory that Christ has purchased for us. So Lord, I pray that you would keep us alert, awake, thinking, and help us to know uh, 
that this, this makes a difference in our own lives as to whether we are defeated as, as individual believers or whether we will triumph in your victory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so hopefully very quickly we're going to go through the armor of God. Uh, first of all, to understand each piece and then to have at least a thought about how to use each piece. And the first piece of the armor of God that's mentioned is uh, in verse 14, the belt of truth. Ephesians 6, 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Now, the actual uh, Greek passage here does not use the word belt. It doesn't say put on the belt of truth. It says, as my translation read, having girded your loins with truth. But because that's talking about the waist area of the, of the body, there's nothing wrong about a translation that says putting on the belt of truth. And that's what we're going to be referring it, uh, to it as. So we're focusing initially on the belt of truth. And as we said, let's first of all try to understand what the belt of truth is before we look at how we can use it. Now, I love it when different commentators disagree because I, I learned something from that. And so when I started reading about the belt of truth, and one commentator said, the focus here is on the doctrinal truth of the Bible and the propositional truth that's taught in the scripture. And then another commentator said, no, the focus here is not on doctrinal truth. It's on a true life, a life of integrity and a life that's characterized by truth. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Here's two sincere men of God who love the Lord, probably a lot more knowledgeable about the scriptures than I am. And they've come to differing conclusions on this. Not to be upset when that happens. It's not that one must be right and the other must be wrong. But what I kind of get out of that when I go back to it as a simple, humble believer is it says put on the belt of truth and it doesn't then explain. So the one guy can't say, I can prove to you that this refers to doctrinal truth. And the other guy can't say, I can prove to you that this refers to uh, the integrity and trueness of life because we simply are not told. And they're developing different aspects of what the Bible teaches about truth, and both are good. So uh, at the outset, and going through the pieces of the armor, I want you to know what my approach to each piece is. It's that unless we are told very specifically, we are going to take the understanding of it to involve the total New Testament teaching on what truth is or righteousness or the word of God, so on. And then we're going to apply that specifically where we most need to apply it. So rather than saying that the belt of truth means one very narrowly focused thing, um, what I want to do is just lay out a big picture for you and then you can grab a hold of those elements uh, that are most important. So the big picture of what truth is in the New Testament is, yes, indeed, doctrinal truth, true statements about God, about Jesus, about sin, about death, about man, about eternal destiny. All of those are crucial parts of the truth. And you can't compromise those and start believing things that are wrong, mm -hmm. and worse yet, passing on to other people things that are wrong without uh, failing in your mission as a Christian soldier. Doctrinal truth is critical. A true life, a life of integrity, a life that takes in the truth and so lives out a life that's characterized by truth. Uh, just one scripture passage that comes to mind, do not lie to one another since you have taken off the old man with its practices. Truth needs to be built into our lives. We need to live lives of integrity. And then for me, the thing that draws together this big picture of truth is remembering that Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. So if as we think of what it means to put the belt of truth on, if, if we're kind of seeing ourselves stepping back and getting a bigger and bigger perspective that's big enough to embrace doctrinal truth, integrity of life, 
And the fact that Jesus, our Savior, is the living truth, I, I think we're doing okay. I think we're doing okay with that. Now, uh, we don't want to then fall into the danger of getting the big picture, but failing to have any practicality to what it means to put on the belt of truth. So now we go on to our second part, using the belt of truth. Some kind of practical application that we can key into and latch on to for how we can use the belt of truth. And again, uh, I am only going to mention one practical application. There could be many applications. The one I mentioned might just hit the nail on the head for someone here. It's just exactly what you need to hear. And for someone else, it might be, well, that's very interesting, but that doesn't relate to my life right at this moment. And there would be other ways that you could apply the thought of what the belt of truth is to your life that would meet a, a need that you're facing. But for each one of the pieces of the armor, I want to give at least one practical application, a suggestion of how to use it in actually fighting the fight of spiritual war. And so I, I asked you and I challenged myself this morning with this question. Are you harboring a destructive lie in your heart right now? Is there something going on in your life where you kind of know that something is true and yet because of your own desires and because of what you want and the way that you would prefer that things would be, you're kind of stiff-arming the Holy Spirit and shoving that aside and saying, no, it's really not that bad if I think about this this way or if I do this or if I follow this course. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can put his finger right on that for you and I. And when he does it, he's not doing it because he doesn't love us. He's doing it because he does love us. Amen. And he knows that a destructive lie in your life can wreak havoc and damage. So let's make it practical here. And again, this may, may not relate to anyone here. But if we, you have a married man or a married woman who is beginning to move towards unfaithfulness to their spouse, that is a destructive lie in your life and it needs to be cut off at the root and rooted out. You know, those thoughts like, well, my husband doesn't really understand me and, you know, it, it, it can't be wrong because it, it meets my need when I'm with this other person. Those are the first steps towards ruin in your marriage. Amen. Absolute ruin. And the person who puts on the belt of truth wakes up one morning and says, you know what? I'm starting to have some feelings toward this person that really are only appropriate towards my own wife or, or towards my own husband. And this relationship is going to end and it's done and it's over. And I'm not going to take one more step in that direction. So that, that's only one example. And I'm sure that if we had time, you guys would have many other suggestions of destructive lies that can destroy our faithfulness to God to begin with and then can really damage the entire course of our lives unless they're rooted out. So, uh, you know, we just can't take real long on any one piece of the armor because we got how many? Six. And you guys would start... No, you wouldn't do that, would you? <laughs> no, Pig's going, no, she wouldn't do that. Okay, that's good. Secondly, the breastplate of righteousness. Still in verse 14, but in the second half of the verse. Uh, Ephesians 6, 14. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I don't even have to go into it again that if someone says, well, righteousness means exactly this here and someone else says it means this or it means this, guess what? We're not told. All it says is the breastplate of righteousness. The rest of it is using wisdom to apply what that's saying in the context of the entire teaching of Scripture, what the Bible teaches us about righteousness. That's what we want to put on is the fullness of, of what God has seen fit to reveal to us about righteousness and the importance of righteousness. Now, in trying to understand that in a pretty comprehensive way, I want to talk about two different aspects of righteousness that are clearly taught in the New Testament. 
And the first one is imputed righteousness. That sounds like a big theological term, and I guess in a way it is. Imputed righteousness. What is imputed righteousness? Imputed righteousness is a righteousness that is not our own. It's a righteousness that's not based on the way that we live or the things that we do or how pure our thoughts are, but rather it's a gift of righteousness. It's a gift that is given to us. It's when the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, who committed no sin, is credited to your account and my account, and we are considered to be completely holy, pure, clean, and righteousness in the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. Paul says it very simply, a righteousness that is not my own, but that which is through the faith of Christ. And I think all of us can get some understanding of how important this is for putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Because every time we come up short, every time we fail, you know, we could feel that's it, I'm done for, I'm going to hell, or, you know, the whole fabric of my Christian life is coming apart. And meanwhile, God, who has saved us and cleansed us and washed us and redeemed us, is saying, don't you guys know better than that? You've put your trust in me. You've come to me in Jesus. I've, wa I've washed your sin away. I've removed it as far as the east is from the west. Stop beating yourself up over it and get up and begin to praise me that you have the righteousness of my son as a gift, not by works, not because you do it right or you're ever going to do it all right, but simply because you've put your trust in him and called upon his name. Amen. So boy, imputed righteousness, that is crucial that we understand that. It's what Paul talks called justification by faith. We're justified not by works of righteousness that we have done, but we're justified by faith, by believing in Jesus. But then there's a second part to righteousness, and that's imparted righteousness. If imputed righteousness is credited to our account apart from anything that we're, we've done, imparted righteousness is when God changes us through regeneration when we're saved, and then progressively the nature of Jesus is built into or breathed into our lives, and we in fact begin to live righteously and begin to live from more and more righteous motives and begin to live with a greater consistency of righteousness in the actual outworking of our lives because not only has righteousness been imputed to us legally, but now it's also being imparted to us so that we're living it out. And that, that's a, you know, I'm not going to say that the New Testament doesn't have a lot else to teach about righteousness, but if, if we need to just grab a hold of the, the essence of things here, I, I think we're not on a bad track. Focusing on that which is perfected already in Jesus, that which he's given to us, but then, yes, God who regenerated us, God who washed us, God who changed us, where it says up there, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Creation, the old has come, uh, the, the old has gone, the new has come. God's looking for that. He's looking not just for that imputed righteousness, he's looking for that righteousness that he has imparted at the time we were saved and that he's developing in our lives through the process of sanctification. So uh, the good news is, is it's not one or the other, but both imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. So how, how do we then use the breastplate of righteousness if we have some kind of an understanding of the essence of what Scripture teaches about this? And uh, two balancing warnings here. Each one kind of balances the other. And the first one I kind of touched on, but to say it again more directly, because this is at the heart of spiritual warfare and combat, don't let Satan beat you up with your sin. Don't let Satan and demons beat you over the head mercilessly with your sin. Just agree with them and get it over. You're right, I'm a sinner. You're right, I don't deserve to go to heaven. You're right, I fail often in many ways. But you know what? My God knows all of that. Amen. And I've come to him for forgiveness and cleansing to 
It's been washed by the blood. And in the eyes of my God, I am whiter than snow. Amen. I'm whiter than snow. The scripture said that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we should be made the righteousness of God in him. Down in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So that, that's an important secret of spiritual warfare. And how many believers have just been disabled by guilt? Whether it's false guilt, whether it's a devil beating them over the head with things that they did weren't even wrong about. Yeah, that happens all the time. Or whether it is genuine guilt, an area of real failure. And yet God's will is that it simply be recognized, confessed, forsaken, and you move on. And me knowing, well, the devil's will is this. That's what he's going to do. And if you think he's going to let up, if you think there's going to be any mercy to that, you do not know your spiritual adversary. He is going to beat the daylights out of you until you stand up and say, you know what? Christ has forgiven me for that. And not only have I failed, but I will fail again. But my God is merciful, and I'm going to walk with him. And he's got it all covered by the blood of Jesus yeah. Christ. So there, there's one balancing exhortation with regard to the breastplate of righteousness. And, but then the second comes from the other direction, and that is this. Don't kid yourself about the damaging effects of continuing in known sin. Don't kid yourself. What if we swing too far the other way and we say, Oh, I'm cleansed by the blood of Christ. I'm going to heaven doesn't really matter how I live. Warning buzzer goes off. Okay, we just went too far in the other direction. Yes, it does, because God who imputed righteousness is also very serious about imparting righteousness. He's very serious about us walking in righteousness. And once the Holy Spirit has convicted us of a sinful practice, then we are responsible to come to him and to seek the grace to put it out of our lives. Many times we will not have immediate success with that. It might be a process. It might be a process of years. But the key is that we're not kidding ourselves anymore and saying, oh, this isn't that bad. Other people do worse. Uh, I, I can do this and still be a Christian. But our attitude rather is to be broken before the Lord and say, Lord, uh, forgive me for this sin that grieves you. I want this out of my life. Please help me. Please lead me. Please show me the road I can Amen. walk so that I can be free from this. And so if we would have on the breastplate of righteousness, yeah, both hands. Don't let the devil beat you up with your sin. But on the other hand, when the Holy Spirit has put his finger on an area of sin in your life, be very serious about coming to the Lord that that can be overcome and that can be rooted out. Uh, just one passage, and this is from the Old Testament, uh, that shows the seriousness of harboring known sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, we could press that too far. It's not like God has utterly abandoned you and forsaken you until that area of sin is dealt with. But in that strong sense of God hearing our prayers and of us being in communion with God, what the old saints call being on praying ground where our prayers are strong and mighty through God, that's a telling verse. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So uh, the breastplate of righteousness is a crucial part of the whole armor of God. Moving on, the shoes of the gospel in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So now we go to the shoes part of the armor. And two thoughts come right to mind. Shoes are needed for a firm footing to be able to stand in the battle. And they're needed for swift running if we have to get somewhere and do something in a hurry. So with, with those kind of background thoughts, um, understanding, first of all, the shoes of the gospel, understanding what's being spoken of here. In Romans 10, 14, and 15, Paul 
uh, references Isaiah 52, 27. Isaiah had said, how beautiful are the feet of those on the mountains who uh, tell of good tidings. And Paul applies that to the gospel. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Isn't that an interesting thing that being in a good relationship as far as the gospel of Jesus Christ is considered to be part of the armor of God? It's not like the other things are all armor and that's just like it has to do with something that we do that's kind of good and kind of nice, but not necessary for our spiritual defense. No, part of the armor of God is that we have on the shoes of readiness to preach the gospel Amen. of peace. Now, why would that be? And again, uh, you know, I'm just sharing my, my best understanding of this and, and the way this works. To begin with, recognize something about that statement of the gospel, the shoes of the gospel. Now, the gospel is not the entirety of biblical revelation. The gospel is a central core of biblical revelation that is absolutely crucial. So the gospel, properly understood, is the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, and that by receiving him, we can have our sins forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. And that is the gospel. Amen. So guess what? There are many aspects of Christian truth that you and I can get wrong. And it's unfortunate, all of Christian truth is valuable. It'd be great if we got everything right. But there are many aspects that, that we can get wrong. Uh, teachings about social relationships and things like that. Teachings about eschatology, when is Christ going to come, pre-mill, post-mill, pre-trib, post-trib, all these things. Many things in the scripture we can afford to get wrong. But what if we get the gospel wrong? What if we get that wrong? What if we're kind of out there communicating well, God loves everyone, and it really doesn't matter uh, who you follow. All paths lead to heaven anyway. When the Bible says plainly that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the Amen. life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. The gospel is that central kernel of Christian truth that we have to get right. There can't be any compromise here. Part of the gospel is that we are saved by faith, not by works. We can't mess up there. We can't teach people, well, it's good that you believed in Jesus, but now unless you do this, 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 and this, you're not going to make it. Amen. You know, it sounds like Jehovah's Witnesses and, and many other groups at that point. They've erred with regard to the gospel, the central core message of truth of the Christian faith. And so having the shoes of the gospel on means that in the essentials of the faith, we are rock solid. And if there's any doubt about that, then why not take some time and review what do you consider to be the essentials of your faith? Are you solid on them? Are you sound on them? Do you stand like a rock on the foundation of those things? Or are you wishy-washy with regard to some things that are core to the Christian faith? Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again bodily. No, not the Christ spirit showing up. No, rose again bodily, ascended to heaven visibly before his disciples. Coming again, this same Jesus, not the Christ spirit coming, this same Jesus coming again. Essential Christian truth, the gospel Amen. of peace. Have it on your feet and don't have any uncertainty about it. Using the shoes of the gospel. I just love the passage in 1 Peter 3.15 where it says, always be ready to give a hope, uh, to give a reason for the hope that is within you to anybody. Always be ready, but yet do it with gentleness and meekness. Amen. So to have the gospel shoes on doesn't mean I'm going out and buttonholing everybody that comes by and trying to get them up against the wall and you know, force them to hear my spiel, whatever that may be. But it means a love for people and a willingness and a readiness at any time 
to share that simple message, even if it's just John 3.16. What more do they need to know? God so loved the world. Amen. God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you'll believe in him, you'll never perish, but you'll have eternal life. Don't say, I can't share the gospel. Memorize John 3.16 and share that with somebody and see what the Holy Spirit will do. I kind of get a kick out of those sporting events, right, where somebody's got the camera angle and John 3.16 is in the background. Well, those people are on to something, you know. Tiger Woods is in his better days making a putt, and then the camera angle pick up, pick up somebody with a John, have you seen that? With a John 3.16 sign, or a, a, over the home run fence at the baseball stadium, there's a John 3.16 banner. So readiness to share the gospel. Now, you'll have to forgive me for this because it's, it's kind of a snarky joke, but it, it makes a point, okay? So here, it, it's actually one of, my, one of my favorite jokes, but we may have very different senses of humor. What do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness and a Unitarian? Does anybody know? What do you get when you cross, you put together and bring together the two elements of a Jehovah's Witness and a Unitarian? Here's what you get. You get someone who's knocking on your door who doesn't have the slightest idea why they're there. <laughs> why is that? Okay, we all know that Jehovah's Witnesses like to knock on doors, and we know that the Unitarians believe that everyone's saved. So wh why do I need to knock on a door? Because everyone's ju doing just fine anyway. Okay. All right, well, in contrast to that, we as Christians are people who may or may not believe in a strategy strategy of going around knocking on doors. That can be fine either way, one way or the other. But we do know what we're here for. Amen. We know that the message we bring is crucial. It's the message of life that makes a difference between heaven and hell, that makes a difference between eternity with God and eternity without God. So the gospel of, the shoes of the gospel of peace are critical. Moving on quickly, the shield of faith. Uh, chapter 6, verse 16. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith. And the picture is not just arrows, but arrows that have been setting up, set alight and have been burning all the brighter because of their passage through the air with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And the shield that's in view here for the Roman soldier was a large four foot by two foot shield that virtually covered the entire body. There was a smaller shield called a buckler that could be held up, but this is that big uh, full size shield, four foot by two foot, in, in essence covers the whole body. Uh, Paul says, put on that shield of faith with which you will be able to quench, not some, but all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I just have two quick quotes for understanding the shield of faith because I believe this commentator said it very well, a man named Layman Strauss, who is with the Lord now. And uh, Layman Strauss in his Ephesians commentary said this, faith here is confidence complete reliance in the person, purposes, and power of God. Implicit trust in him alone can quench the enemy's darts. So just well said. Some of the words that jump out, confidence, reliance, trust, and it's trust in a person that no matter what the enemy throws at us, we have a relationship with the Lord that enables us to stand and to uh, put out, to quench those fiery darts as we continue to trust and believe and have faith in our Savior. And then uh, Layman Strauss continued, there are a thousand and more perils that would burn themselves into our lives to render us helpless in the battles of life. Against these satanic fiery darts of pride, envy, jealousy, covetousness, worry, unbelief, impurity, we need a sure defense. Paul calls that defense the shield of faith. So we hold up that shield of faith. Doesn't do any good sitting on the shelf. Fiery darts 
are going to penetrate and they're going to do some real damage. But as long as we hold up that shield, the promise is secure. We can quench not some, but all, Amen. all of the fiery darts of the evil one. Okay, a practical application to this, using the shield of faith, very brief and quick here. Um, I would encourage myself as well as you to nail down some planks of things that you believe before God in prayer. Go over the things that you believe are essential to your faith and make it a matter of meditation and prayer to nail these down and in effect say, I'm not going to rethink this. This is not something that's going to be allowed to come up for, for future consideration and evaluating and balancing this against it. These are things that I've settled in prayer before God, before his throne, with the word of God opened in prayer. And I nail this down and I'm not going to rethink it. You know, it comes to mind for me, and it's a very kind of popular level phrase for Christians, but properly understood, it's, it's a crucial plank to nail down. And what is that? That God is good and he's good all the Amen. time. Amen. All the time. Are you going to let yourself rethink that one when the, the stuff hits, when the tragedy that you just never thought you'd had to face comes along, when the bottom seems to drop out of everything that you thought was solid in your life? Are you going to reevaluate? Well, you know, maybe God, maybe he's not good. Or, or maybe he's good only under certain conditions. No, it's, it really is a plank of our faith. God is good all the time. If we put it in biblical doctrines, ter doctrine terms from 1 John, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Now, if I find myself, and, and we could in our weakness, reevaluating that and saying, I don't know, you know, that's not the God I thought I knew, the God I, I thought I received, the Christ that I, I thought I knew, and, you know, maybe I, I ought to look in this direction instead. The day that you and I wake up and, and think that thought is, is a, a time to nip that right in the bud Amen. and nail down those planks before God and say, this is not subject to future consideration. Amen. This is the foundation that my life is built on. Here, as Martin Luther said, here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And so the, the popular way, again, I'm trying to give something practical. How can we use the shield of faith? Nail down some planks. Refuse to reconsider them. And the popular uh, way that is expressed is this. Resolve to never doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light. Amen. Build that into your way of living. Never doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light. I know for myself that a lot of times when I, when I wake up first thing in the morning, it's like you know negative thoughts want to hit me and, and uh, attack me at that point until I'm kind of up and moving and going. So I will not use that time when I first wake up in the morning to evaluate any kind of life decision or the way that I should view something that's, that's coming up in my life. That's not the time to do it. I know that I can be subject to depression at certain times of the year and under certain circumstances. And if, I'm, if I know that I'm feeling kind of depressed, I'm not going to reevaluate my spiritual underpinnings or what I'm doing for the Lord or where my course is heading at that particular time. I'm just going to say, no, I'm not going to think about that right now. There'll be a time to think about that, but I'm not going to do it while I'm feeling depressed. Oh, doubly so if you're sick, if you're physically ill. That's not the time to reevaluate your faith because you're weakened. Your body is yelling at you. Um, so, boy, that, yeah, there's some wisdom there. Do not doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light. Okay. The helmet of salvation. 6, 17, the first part of the verse. And take the helmet of salvation. Again, I love it because no one can say, well, what he means by salvation is this. No, he doesn't say what he means by it. He just uses the word salvation. 
And then it's up to you and I to dig through the New Testament and see what salvation is in the scriptures. And all of that is relevant to putting on the helmet of salvation. At its basic, salvation is deliverance from sin and death through the person and work of Christ. What we just celebrated in partaking of communion this morning. That's the basics of it. We're set free from sin and death through Jesus and his love for us and what he did for us. So Christ accomplished our salvation at the cross. We received that salvation by believing in Jesus. And God is committed to preserve us to final deliverance. It's not a lot else that we really need to know about that. There's a lot else that, yeah, it's worth knowing and good to know. But the kernel is there. Jesus accomplished salvation objectively on the cross. We receive it when we called on his name and believed in him. And God is able to preserve us and keep us not just to eternity, but through all of eternity. Uh, Layman Strauss, who I really enjoyed reading his Ephesians commentary preparing for this message, he says, the scriptures teach that we are saved, he really is saying we have already been saved, that we are saved, that we are being saved, and that we shall be saved. So he's talking about three tenses of salvation, past, present, future. We are saved, we are being saved, we shall be saved. He continues, Every Christian can stand in the calm confidence that the death of Christ has saved him, the resurrected Christ is keeping him, and the coming Christ will preserve, preserve him safely through eternity. Amen. Isn't that good? Yeah. You know what you're doing when you think about that? You could even just go like this. You're putting on that helmet of salvation. You're not walking around saying, well, I don't know, you know, I hope I'm going to heaven. I, I hope that, I, you know, I'll make it, that I won't sin one too many times or the stupid things we sometimes think. No, we put on that helmet of salvation and we build those truths into our lives. The death of Christ paid for all of my sin. When I received him, I was washed and cleansed by the blood and God is able to keep me right until the end. Put on the helmet of salvation. Every Christian can stand in the calm confidence that the death of Christ has saved him, the resurrected Christ is keeping him, and the coming Christ will preserve him safely through eternity. Think of Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Now, I don't want to go really long today, and we still have the sort of the spirit to cover. So in terms of a, a practical kind of hint or something that might be helpful in the actual battle, you know, for many people, the problem with the helmet of salvation is not any of the truth that I prevented, presented, but it's the fact that they lack the assurance of salvation. And we won't do that this morning, but if we went around here and every, we were all completely honest, I have to believe that there are some people in this room who are saved and have been born again and know the Lord, but they're not certain of that and they're fearful about that. Many Christians lack assurance of salvation. And even though you may be born again and you've been washed in the blood and you're heaven, headed for heaven, if the enemy can shake your confidence in that, if you go through life thinking, man, I hope so. You know, boy, I, I, I hope I'll be there. I hope my name's written in the book of life. Well, is there an answer? Yeah, I believe there is. I believe you bring those fears to God. Amen. And you share that and you're honest with him about it. Lord, I know what the Bible says about salvation and I've believed in you. And I don't know why, but I'm just fearful that I'm not going to be there, that I'm not going to make it. And I believe that over time, God will lead you through a process of meditating on the truth of his word, standing on the written word of God that says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Many other scriptures, he who believes in me has already crossed over from death into life. And uh, God will bring you to that place of assurance. 
But it's not a happy place to be if you lack the assurance of salvation. So why not, as, as part of the application of this message today, if that's you, why not go home later on and pray and say, God, I want that helmet of salvation buckled more firmly on my head. I want to have that absolute confidence that I'm your child and I'm headed for eternity with you. And I believe God will lead you in that path to bring that full assurance of salvation. Finally, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, 17b. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And uh, we can't do better than understanding the sword of the Spirit than seeing how Jesus used the sword of the Spirit when he was tempted, right? The devil came to him three different times with three different temptations, but Jesus had the same answer essentially every time. It is written. Amen. It is written. Uh, command these stones to become bread if you're hungry. Now it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Oh, if you're so great, jump down from the temple. No, it is written, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Oh, I have all the powers and authority of this world, which in a limited sense is true that God allowed Satan to be the prince of the power of the earth. And I can give it to whomever I will, just bow down and worship me. Now, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. All three of them quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. You know, I believe there's a place for contemporary prophecy, and I, I am blessed by the ministry of some contemporary prophets. But I'm glad that the bedrock issues of my faith are not based on what some contemporary prophet is saying. They're based on the authoritative word of God. Amen. Every word God breathed and inspired. And that's the sword of the spirit. It is written. And how much good is it going to know you if you don't know what's written about the things that the devil is attacking you for? If you don't know what the promises of God are in the areas where you're weak and inclined to fall. And uh, the enemy comes and attacks you, and rather than running into a strong armed soldier with a sword drawn saying, it is written, he runs into a vacillating, well, I, I, I thought somewhere in the Bible it, it said that. So the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the absolute authority of the written Word is truth. It's God-breathed. It's God-breathed. It's like silver refined seven times over. There's no, uh, nothing that is not true and solid in it. Okay, practically using the sword of the Spirit, building the Word of God into your life at areas of weakness, areas where you tend to fall. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 119.9? In what way shall a young man cleanse his way? Good question. How can I live a pure life in the midst of this wicked, sinful, filthy, ungodly world? And, you know, don't get hung up on the young man because it applies to young women as well. How shall a young person, and don't even get hung up on the young, how shall someone, how shall a person cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Build the word of God into your life. Be disciplined about it. Meditate on the scriptures. Study the scriptures. Memorize key passages. And then uh, just a few verses down from that, that was Psalm 119.9. Then Psalm 119.11, the same psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. If you had a list of three or four areas where you are most likely to fall into sin, okay, thankfully we're not going to do that at the moment, I'm glad for that, aren't you? Yeah. Um, but if you had to do that, okay, then here's the question. All right, what scriptures have you memorized that relate specifically to those areas of temptation so that when you're faced with them, you can recite them? Just like that. You wake up at 2 in the morning, it's there. You're going through the day and something hits you unexpectedly and you're, you're tempted to do something you shouldn't do. If it's yelling at your spouse or whatever, 
It's scripture that memorizes right there. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such as good for edifying. So, you know, a lot of these things, sort of the spirit, there's no mystery about it. It's, it's laziness that's our greatest enemy. There's things we can do to build the word of God into our lives so that we can stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Okay, so um, I wanted to include prayer because that's crucial, but that's going to be a message for another day. So I'm just very quickly going to summarize my thoughts on spiritual war and the armor of God, and then we're going to close in prayer. So my desire has been to get us into Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. I want you and me to become good friends with this passage. I want you to read it so many times that you end up saying, I don't even have to work at memorizing it because, wow, it's already been memorized just by reading it 50 times. Become good friends with Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And don't say, well, why that passage? Why not some, some other? Okay, do, do some others too. That's great. But do that one. Okay, right. become good friends. Here we see clearly that we are in a spiritual war. We have no choice about this. You and I are in the war, whether we like it or not. The devil and the demons under him are out to destroy you and I and our faith, whether we like it or not. We are in the spiritual war. Using the metaphor of, a belief, of the believer as a Christian, we are taught how to prepare for, how to fight, and how to win this war. So accept that identity of yourself as part of your identity as a Christian, not the whole of it, but a big part of it. You are a soldier. And so you need to understand the war you're in, you need to fight in the war you're in, and you need to fight to win. There are two basic exhortations in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. Be strong in the Lord and stand firm firm in the Lord. Is that simple yeah. enough? Yeah. That's what we're called to do. Be strong and stand firm in the Lord. And we do this how? By putting on the armor of God. By taking up the armor of God. We must understand each piece of the armor and we must use each piece of the armor. And note my approach because I think it has value. Be solid on the breadth of biblical teaching for each of those pieces of armor, whether it be faith, righteousness, Jews, whatever it is. Be, be solid, expose yourself to the breadth of biblical teaching on these things, and then practically, strategically make decisions about how you can build that armor into your life for areas that are areas of weakness for you. <coughs> This is a fight that each of us can and must win. And so I say in the words of Charles Wesley's great hymn, soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Stand in the strength that God supplies through his eternal son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. Let's pray. Lord, I know this message has gone a little long this morning, but I, I just didn't want to break up the armor and uh, not be able to at some point just lay it all out in one message so that that beautiful big picture of the whole armor can be seen. And I pray, Lord, that... Uh, you would help each one of us to apply the thoughts from Ephesians 6 to our own lives in the way that is most needful. And Lord, show us what it means to be victorious. Lord, surprise us and amaze us that we say, wow, I didn't think I could live that strongly, that consistently under those circumstances. But we, we can do it because you promised that we can and because you've given us the armor of God so that we can be more than conquerors. We can be victors in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, bless my brothers and sisters, and I pray that this uh, 
has been helpful to them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.